picture Wilshire Boulevard right now, but erase all of the cars, all of the pavement, all of the buildings. Cover that area in lush, green grasslands. Add trees to that landscape. Add beautiful running, babbling brooks. Mammoths, camels, bison, horses in their herds roaming around, eating. Hiding in those trees, picture that saber-toothed cat that is watching and looking for what its easiest meal is. And it's waiting for the right opportunity to strike because it's hungry too. You've got this wide open landscape covered in animals. There's so much here and there's no way we would have found it if there wasn't a subway being built. I'm Dr. Ashley Ledger. I'm the field director for paleontology for Cogstone Resource Management. We do mitigation for paleontology, archeology, span historical, or cultural resources. So when there is a construction project that's in association with possibly fossils or artifacts or even historic buildings, we're one of the teams that can be subcontracted to come out and make sure that none of those are destroyed, that they get to live in perpetuity and either go into a museum or if it's a historic building, it gets to stay intact. And so we were hired for the Purple Line extension and we're there day in and day out. If they're moving soil, we're right there watching so that we can save all of these beautiful fossils. The Purple Line is probably one of the best jobs that a paleontologist could get. It's one of the only construction projects that is going directly through this rich paleo zone in the La Brea Tar Pits area. The potential to find fossil is tremendous, and we actually have found hundreds of fossils since we've been digging these three stations that are part of our first phase of the project. The Purple Line is one of the most important projects that are now being built in LA County. It's a nine-mile subway project that will connect Koreatown to Westwood VA Hospital. It's going to get people between downtown Los Angeles and the west side in about 25 minutes. I defy you to try to do that in a car during rush hour. It's going to connect the two biggest employment and population centers of Los Angeles, and it's really going to help people get where they need to go faster, more reliable, and uh, quicker. Fossil discoveries are no surprise on Metro projects. If you look at the red line, that was built from downtown Los Angeles to North Hollywood, there were thousands of fossils that were found as part of that uh, tunneling work. Uh, that line opened in 2000 in North Hollywood. We actually found 2,000 fossils while we were tunneling between downtown Los Angeles and North Hollywood. A lot of these fossils were new to the fossil record. They hadn't been previously documented. Uh, we anticipate that we will find more fossils as we move forward with construction with our second and third phases of station construction for the Purple Line. Fossils, historically, are quite rare. We estimate that less than 1% of life on Earth actually fossilizes, and so the fact that we're finding so many fossils in such a compact area is just really overwhelming. LA is a basin, and we are bordered by water on one side and mountains on the other side. Water and wind go hand in hand and move lots and lots of sediment. So as sea level fluctuates, we get sea level bringing in lots of sediment with it that settles out on the surface. Then we also get erosion from the mountains that comes down and it has to settle somewhere. Los Angeles is basically a big bowl, and so it is collecting all of that sediment. We're finding everything you or your children can think of from the Ice Age. We're finding mammoths and mastodons, camels, bison, horses, giant ground sloths, which when I say sloth, you think slow, cute, little cuddly thing. No, I'm talking giant ground sloth. These things are the size of Volkswagen beetles. This is a nearly complete pelvis of a giant ground sloth. And it's so beautifully preserved. We still have the complete roundness here this is the birth canal from this animal. So by the curvature and the size, we can tell that this animal was a female. And because its hips don't lie, we have named this one Shakira. This is one of my favorites. This is Andy. This is the fossilized horn core of the long horned form of bison. And this is in life position as we found it, still in its original plaster jacket and being cleaned here in the lab. This loose sediment will be taken out and you can see they're working on reconstructing the broken pieces. But we have from the very tip of the horn core all the way back to the burr where it attaches to what would have been the rest of the skull. We don't know what happened to the rest of the skull, but it's still amazing to find something of this caliber. For comparison, if you look at the size of Andy's horn core, it's almost three feet in length. And this is the horn core from one of the other bison skulls we have found. This one was also broken and detached from the skull. But just for a size comparison, you can see how much bigger Andy is than this specimen. It just shows the diversity of life we had along the Purple Line expansion. 
That horn core we used for comparison is actually the second horn to this skull here, also found along the purple line. But you can see that we do have the rest of the skull from this individual, but it is in rough condition. That's what paleontological glues are for. We're actually working on taking these small, broken pieces and fitting them back together so that we can reconstruct the face of this animal. This is Hayden. This is my baby. This is the first major find we found during purple line excavation. Hayden was found fairly shallow. It was only 15 to 20 feet below what is now Wilshire Boulevard. We have both tusks still in socket, which is really a remarkable find. It was found face up, so we're actually looking at the underside. These items here that sort of look like the bottoms of your tennis shoes, these are its teeth. It has a very flat grinding surface so that it could grind up five to 700 pounds of vegetation every single day. And mammoth teeth are unique. They don't grow up into the mouth like our teeth do. They actually slide in from the back and push forward like a conveyor belt. They'll go through six sets of teeth during their lifetime. And when Hayden died, we actually have a progression of those teeth. This is the old tooth at the front of the mouth that is wearing down flat. This will eventually slide all the way forward and fall out. The animal will either spit it out or swallow it. This is the new tooth that is just starting to develop. This will continue to progress forward from the back, and as it slides forward, more of these enamel plates will develop and give it its chewing surface. So this is the second and third tooth this animal has had in its life. This is a limb bone from a camel. Not nearly as big, but still impressive. And remember, I said every bone tells a story. This one tells a story of its life after its death. You can see all of these gouges around the edge of the bone. Those are bite marks. That's another animal was chewing on this bone. And there's really only one reason to gnaw on a bone. It is to get at the marrow cavity, the hole that runs through the center. That is where most of the nutrition would be contained within these bones. So these animals are gnawing off the ends of the bones, probably dire wolves. If you have a dog or a cat at home, you know they love to eat meat, but your dog is far more likely to chew on a bone than your cat is. It's because they are evolutionarily trained. Their instinct is to get at the marrow cavity inside. So these boxes here, full of fragments, will unfortunately not be put back together, but they're still really unique. These large chunks of bone from the marine layer likely belonged to a whale. So about 60 feet below where we found Hayden, the mammoth skull, about 100,000 years or more before that, there were whales in that exact same area. Paleontology really does tell a story. You just have to find it. So we're over 2,000 fossils already, but many of those are microfossils. So every time we excavate a visible fossil, so something that's large enough that we can see underground, we take a sediment sample with that. So we take a big like five gallon paint bucket or larger and collect just the dirt around it because we know in that moment in time, the fossil preservation was right in that area. So we collect the sediment around it. We then bring that back to the lab. We wash all of the sediment. We have the cleanest dirt around. And we pick through that under a microscope looking for small things like rodent teeth, rodent bones, fish bones, snail shells, and all those little tiny things that we cannot see. Those microfossils tell us more about the environment than say do the camels or the mammoths. If a mammoth doesn't like the environment it's living in, it can migrate several miles a day and just go live somewhere else. Things like gophers and rabbits are more confined to a smaller area because they just don't have the body size to migrate far away. So they're actually giving us a glimpse into the climate of the time. Construction and paleontology go hand in hand, at least in California. California has very strict environmental laws that actually protect the fossils and artifacts in the ground. If you're digging in an area where you could find fossils or artifacts, you have to have someone there who can identify that fossil or artifact so that they can end up in the museum. Not every state has that. All of these fossils you're looking at, if they would have been uncovered in Kansas, if they added a subway there, they can all legally be bulldozed. There are no laws protecting the fossils there. Los Angeles is unique in the fact that California has laws to protect these fossils. And these fossils would have never been found if it wasn't for the subway excavation. So without construction, these fossils would still be sitting underground 
probably never to be seen because we're not just going to dig big holes under Wilshire Boulevard. So there's multi a multitude of steps that takes place between initial discovery and where it will eventually end up in a museum. Anytime there is excavation going on underground, there is one of our staff standing right next to that piece of equipment watching for the first sign of fossils. Our team has a very close working relationship with the person driving that heavy equipment. And so when they're digging, and all of a sudden there's that color change or that texture change that makes us think, look, this could be a fossil. We'll wave at them, or sometimes we have flagging tape, which is a bright colored pink or yellow tape, and we'll have you know three or four feet pulled out, and we just throw that whole roll in front of them. It kind of flutters down like a beautiful ribbon, and they're like, oh, the paleontologist sees something. And then they'll give us the universal sign of, go ahead and take a look. They take their hands and their feet off their equipment to show us that they're not going to move it. It is safe for us to cross in front of it. And at that point, we have to tell that operator, hey, I've got fossils here. Can you work 50 feet that way? Because we never stop work. We try to divert it. We don't want to slow down the progression of the subway. We want them to keep working. So we'll work on excavating whatever they just found and they can keep digging 50 feet away from us. And we'll just send another team member to go watch the new dirt. And then sometimes when it gets to the point of things in a big plaster jacket, we'll, we'll say, hey, can you guys stop for a second and come help us move this to get it out of the way? And then as soon as it's out of the way, they can go right back to working. Once they come out of the ground, they usually come to my office if they're small. If they're big, we can get a truck to bring them to our lab, which is also in Southern California. They come to the lab, we do all the cleanup to make them museum ready, because when these go to the museum, we do not want them to have to do any work. It is part of the contract that we take care of everything, so when the museum gets it, they are ready for either going on the shelf or going on display. Once we've collected all the fossils we can and everything has been cemented and steeled and they're working on things other than excavation, we will get everything cleaned and prepped and finished up here in the lab, and then we'll take it all to the museums. Now, the way the contract was written for the Purple Line is unique. There's actually two museum repositories specified. It was determined that any fossils found within the asphalt, so anything found in tar, would go to the La Brea Tar Pits Museum because they are very good at dealing with things in asphalt. And then any fossils that were found essentially clean and dry in non-asphaltic sediments would go to the Natural History Museum. Both entities are part of the Natural History Museum, but they live in two separate facilities. We thought we would be taking truckloads to the La Brea Tar Pits because we were working so close at the Fairfax station. We have only a handful of bones that have actually come out of the asphalt. Most of our fossils will go to the Natural History Museum. Now at that point, they will become part of the collection and so scientists from all over the world will be able to come and take a look at those specimens. Now we've been fortunate in finding some really spectacular, beautifully, preserved specimens. And so we're hoping that they end up on display. It's different when you walk up and the sign says, found at the intersection of Wilshire and La Cienega. This animal lived literally in your backyard. So we can't necessarily find the exact nucleus for why the megafauna extinction happened at the end of the Pleistocene. There's of course a multitude of theories and some of them have more backing than others. And the four theories have very cute, catchy names. They are overkill, overchill, overill, and overspill. So the first one is overspill, which is a large crater impact like that that took out the dinosaurs. But we don't really have evidence of a giant impact site. And so that theory is usually the least accepted. Then there's the overill theory, which is some sort of disease that gets into the population and it spreads very quickly and it starts killing out a lot of the animals but we're not seeing as much evidence of disease in fossils as we would expect. So those two are the least widely accepted. The two that are most accepted are overkill and overchill, which probably go hand in hand. Overchill is obviously climate change. So something happens with the climate, causes a change in vegetation. Vegetation likes a specific environment, so do small creatures. And if the vegetation changes, the big animals follow the vegetation. The other is overkill. At the end of the Pleistocene is when we see the onset of humans. And humans like to eat things that were once living. And so they will hunt things for, for sustenance. That process of something eating something else, eating something else is trophic cascade. And the animal at the highest point of that pyramid is the one that is most greatly affected by the trickle down effect. Now, of course, as climate changes, things have to adapt or die. Right now we're seeing unprecedented temperature increases because of 
greenhouse gas emissions. And we're not sure how the animal species are going to adapt to that. They're going to have to move to find other sources that are suitable to their living environments, or they're going to die out. And so it's all a matter of time. There's not an instant where everything dies and all these megafauna extinctions happen. It happens gradually over thousands of years. And it's because of changing environmental factors. If you study the past and you study the present, it can tell you about the future. So we continue digging. They're ready to do all of the steel work that actually goes into building a train station. And so they're working on the next two stations at Rodeo Drive and Century City. And we have already found fossils in Century City. So we know that we're going to continue to have more fossils as we follow the Purple Line excavation. And everyone is excited because this brings a whole different spin to the construction project. Everyone right now is excited about the end product. They're excited for when the subway opens so that they can have that shorter traverse across the city. But in the meantime, it's seen as a little bit of a nuisance. There's more noise, there's more dust. There's all these things that have that negative connotation to them. But the paleontology turns that around because even though it's noisy and dusty and the traffic takes a little bit longer to get through, look at all the fossils they're finding that they're saving that will go into a museum that we would have never found if it wasn't for the subway. And so it's great to show the public the positive side of the construction phase, not just the excitement about the end product, but all the steps to get to that product are just as exciting.